welcome everybody. I'm going to do this in English as well because otherwise uh, Dr. Megan Rossi doesn't understand what we're talking and she's really insecure as you can see. So uh, we better keep it English. <laughs> no. I'm sorry for my ignorance in terms of lack of Dutch. Yeah, well. I wish I could speak more than one language. That would be a dream. So I'm very envious of all of you smart cookies that can fit more than one language in their brain. Well, you, you too. You've got Aussie. And English. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you're right, you're right. The Aussie slang, there's a whole other language there. Yeah, absolutely. Completely different than, uh, <laughs> yeah, than English. Well, never mind. Okay, peeps, really, really nice. I think still people dropping in, but that's fine. Welcome, everyone. Tonight we uh, have a really special guest, Dr. Megan Rossi. She has just released the Dutch version of her book. And in England, how many sold did you sell of the book? I think we've, we've gotten to like 80,000. Yeah, incredible. Like that. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty mind blowing in terms of yeah, how many lives we've reached and how many bellies hopefully we've changed for good. Yeah, well, let's hope we're going to do the Dutch uh, as proud as, as, yeah, as the English version. So it's, I've, I've had it here. And uh, you're going to tell me lots more about it. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what to do. Um, I think I better, yeah, start by introducing you. You started off first from school as a dietitian, and then you got really more into the belly problems, if I'm correct. And you thought, okay, I'm, there is so much more to explore. And you thought, okay, let's get a PhD. So you did. So you're now Dr. Megan Rossi, and you've got a really, really nice clinic in, in London, and you're helping people online. And the amount of people you're helping, it's incredible. And um, yeah, so many raving fans you have. So yeah, the Dutch version of your book, yeah, we need it. Yeah, I think the best thing to do is maybe you can talk a little bit more about yourself and then maybe we can start off with a presentation on uh, Eetgeluk. Yeah. Oh, God. I need to learn how to pronounce it. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's not just, yeah, it's really hard to get that tongue lock. Eating <laughs> cluck. Yeah. So thank you very much for that introduction. So um, I, like, like you mentioned, started out um, with a huge interest in food and science. So I've always loved food. Um, but actually, it wasn't until my final year studying in nutrition and dietetics when I, I guess, had my first conscious encounter with the gut. So I actually grew up on a farm when I was younger. Um, so good gut health is inherent to my upbringing. But my first conscious memory actually was in my final year studying nutrition and dietetics when sadly I actually lost my grandma to bowel cancer. And um, that had a really big impact on me because I was very, very close with her. And, you know, after that, I somewhat suppressed kind of that relationship with the gut, which was hugely negative. And I started working as a clinical dietitian. So in the hospital setting with quite sick people and actually started to notice that people of all different diseases started to complain of gut issues. I thought, gosh, what is it about this organ? And that's when I decided, you know what, I owe it to my grandma and to my patients to do a PhD in that area because it was 2010. So not a lot of research um, necessarily had come out around the the gut at that point in time. So I did the PhD and I was yeah completely blown away by the fact that actually targeting our gut health through the right nutrition really can have broad sweeping benefits in terms of things like our mental health, our heart health. Um, and I was also very fortunate to be the nutritionist for the Australian Olympic synchronized swimming team. And actually found the girls that had the most performance anxiety also had the most number of gut issues. So it was clear to me, it wasn't just in like sick people where there was this issue. It was like a global thing. So at that point I knew I wanted to dedicate the rest of my career to gut health. So I looked around the world who was doing the most innovative gut health research. It was King's college in London um, at the time. So I applied, for a job and was very fortunate to get one. So I moved over to UK in London about five years ago. Um, so yeah, I continue to work at King's as a research fellow, doing all different types of clinical trials and looking at how food affects the gut essentially. But then also have the gut health clinic and then yeah, the platform on social media, which for me has just been the most empowering um, opportunity to really 
you know, share the evidence that's coming out because it's coming so fast because what we're finding out about the gut is changing all the time. So, yeah, that's my little ramble as to, I guess, how I got into this area. Okay, well, it's sharing your knowledge is, yeah, it's something you do very well. And, yeah, you see that you're following. People really love your worth and the the, the way you express yourself. So, yeah, please do. Um, you've made a presentation for tonight. I have, yes. Very About diligent. <laughs> yeah, uh, we just uploaded it, so we're going to see if it works. I'm going to open the slides now. Let me see that I, yeah, final one. And I'm going to press start. Hopefully, you all see it really big now in your screen. And you see Megan and me really small down the bottom. Is that correct? Looks yeah? good to me. Good. OK, so I'm going to switch my camera off. And uh, please, Megan, take us uh, down the road. I will, I will. So, like I said, we've got about half an hour together. I'm going to whiz through um, Eat and Cluck um, and just give you a bit of a taste, I guess, to the different elements w um, of, you know, what's in it. But now, before we actually get into, I guess, the sciencey part, I wanted to, us all to take a step back and ask ourselves, what actually is gut health? So, for you guys who've join, joined in, I want you to um, have a think about what you think gut health is. So, we've got a poll coming up. And there is four different options. So, do you think it's around digestion? Do you think it's to do with the bacteria? Do you think it's A, B, and more? Or who actually is going to be quite honest and say, you know what, they've got no idea, and, and that's why you've joined in. It's my job to tell you what gut health actually is. So if you select your answer, great. Looks like quite a lot of you are very knowledgeable. One more, two more seconds to make your final pick. Brilliant. Okay, so 88% of you said it is C. So it's about digestion, bacteria, and much, much more, which we'll definitely uh, be talking about. So yes, you're right. C is uh, the correct answer, so to speak. So essentially, gut health relates to the functioning of our entire digestive tract. So you can see this nine meter long tube there. So food um, delivers, so this tube delivers the food from entry all the way to exit. Now, why gut health is so important if i had to distill it down there's really three main reasons now the first one is you know the old saying you are what you eat well that's kind of not overly correct correct in terms of the science it's more you are what you digest and that's because no matter how healthy the food is you put it into your body if you don't have a good gut lining you're not going to be able to extract all that nutrition um, out of your food so in order to get the most out of your food you need to have good gut health now, the second one, which is obviously hugely important at the moment with COVID-19, is the fact that 70% of our immune system actually lays along this nine meter digestive tract, so that nine meter tube that delivers the food from entry all the way to exit. 70% of our immune system lays there. And the third element, which has really brought the fame to this concept of gut health, is the fact that we do contain trillions of microbes. And we'll talk much more about what microbes actually are. But my nickname for our gut microbiota is our GM. So uh, you'll hear me using that word quite a bit. Now, the, probably the most common question I get asked is actually, how do you know if you've got a healthy gut? Uh, so in um, Eat and Gluck, I have uh, a range of different assessments. And the first one is uh, a little 10 question assessment on how healthy your gut is. So we've got a range um, on the point system. So it's really just to get a bit of a flavor um, to, you know, how healthy and how good you're doing at the moment in terms of gut health. Now, for those who don't yet have the book, you can get to this, um, the first assessment um, at the website. So the guthealthdoctor.com. Now, like I mentioned, we will touch on Eat and Gluck, just the different key chapters. So there, um, I think there's nine chapters altogether, but we're just going to focus or zip through uh, eight of these chapters. And again, I just want you to get a bit of a flavor 
as to the different elements um, of your gut health and essentially how we can look after it using really simple and practical evidence-based strategies. So the first chapter is all about understanding your gut, which, you know what, is actually a hugely important thing because in today's day and age, we're very fixated on what we're putting into our bodies, but as soon as we've swallowed it, actually very few of us know what happens so i think it's really important that we actually have an understanding of what happens along that nine meter digestive tract so if we imagine just think whatever you're having for dinner or had for dinner tonight just imagine you're chewing that in your mouth now this is actually where digestion begins because we not only start to physically break down the food but we also have chemicals in our saliva which actually start to chemically break down the food. And actually, there's been a really uh, nice study that's shown how many times we chew our food can have a really important role in our digestion. So you can see this graph here. What they've done is they used nuts, I think it was uh, almonds, and they got people, a group of people to chew the almonds just 10 times and then swallow it. Another group chewed it 25 times and then swallowed it. And the group who chewed it 40 times also then swallowed it. And what they did is assessed how much of that almond was undigested in their poop. Um, so yes, they took poop samples from all of the participants and uh, analyzed how much the almond was left over and found that those who only chewed their food 10 times actually didn't digest the almond very well. So they didn't extract a lot of that nutrition out of it, kind of passed through them. So I think it's really important when we're thinking about you know, digestion, we actually do chew our food quite well. And, and I find in clinical practice that can help um, overcome a lot of uh, common uh, symptoms like bloating. So once we've swallowed our food, it then makes its way into the stomach, which is kind of like a washing machine and it kind of cleans and adds detergent until our food forms a puree, which then makes its way into this long windy tube. Now, this is a really odd name, but it's called the small intestine, even though it's six meters long. So it's certainly not small. And this is actually where most of our food gets from our gut into our blood. So most of their digestion actually happens there. Now, anything that doesn't get digested then makes its way into this final fat part called the large intestine. And it's in this large intestine where most of those microbes, so our GM, mainly lives. Now. A really important thing is to think about that nine meter digestive tract, kind of not just like a tube, but actually there's a whole heap of muscles and there's many different ways the food moves through that. And once we have a greater understanding of how food affects the different sections, it actually starts to make sense why some people get symptoms with different foods. So, um, for example, alcohol. Um, when some people have alcohol who are quite sensitive to it, they might find they get reflux. And that's because alcohol slows down the emptying of the stomach, which is that little sac there. But also we know alcohol speeds up, accelerates the final part in that large intestine, which is why other people actually get diarrhea or get loose poops when they have alcohol. So in my clinic, I have a, you know, a very thorough understanding. We talk more about this book in the book at how different foods actually accelerate or change how a gut moves uh, and we see that with caffeine so coffee as well now swiftly moving on to more about these microbes which is uh really a key part to our gut health and i think it's important we appreciate it's not just bacteria so we talk about our microbes being bacteria but we also have a lot of beneficial viruses and fungi such as yeast living within that some fun facts for you, which you may already know, is that we actually contain more bacterial cells than we do human cells in our body. And what's even more important is that these um, bacteria, actually the number of genes they have, which essentially is the skills they have in terms of the things they can do in like producing hormones and vitamins, actually outnumbers um, the number of genes humans have by several fold, suggesting that, you know, without our bacteria, we couldn't do half the things that our body does. Um, we think it's on its own, but actually the bacteria and the microbes doing so much for us. And the other thing is our microbes, our GM is unique to us. So even identical twins have very different microbes. Now, if we have a quick look at our microbes CV, um, so our gut microbes can do so many things. And one of the impressive things is they're very strong communicators. So they can talk to all of our organs, um, including our brain through three main mechanisms. One is through um, the immune cells, which is kind of like an alarm system. We then have the nervous system. Uh, so that's where we've got these vagus nerve. You may have heard of that one where our microbes can communicate like that. It's kind of like a mobile phone. And then we also have the blood vessels where our microbes can actually produce some chemicals and that gets into our blood system and that's thought to communicate with our other organs, including our brain. 
Now, I like to think our, our microbes in their CV uh, also um, highlights that they're quite an experienced bodyguard. So they do protect us from quite a lot of things. And actually, a really nice paper pulled together all the clinical trials looking at probiotics in um, reducing our risk of the common cold. And overall, the study suggested that specific probiotics, and they're essentially good microbes, and we'll talk more about them soon, actually were able to reduce our risk of the common cold um, by quite a significant amount. And if we did get a common cold, on average, it would reduce it compared to placebo, which is a fake intervention, by around two days. So, you know, our microbes really do prevent uh, or help us, um, you know, fight against things like different viruses. In terms of COVID, the evidence is certainly not strong there yet. There is no evidence to say that a probiotic can help. Uh, but I know some study, um, some research groups are actually looking at that. Now, our microbes are also um, very impressive when it comes to um, understanding biochemistry. So they are essentially pharmacists or chemists in that they do metabolize a whole heap of different drugs. So if we're on different medications, we know our microbes can uh, change them. And, and some medications our microbes actually activate and make work better. Other ones our microbes actually deactivate. And some our microbes actually can turn into toxins. And this is why we see pe different people actually react to medications in very different ways. And actually, there's a range of research coming through highlighting uh, that medications, um, sorry, our microbes may determine why some people are better at responding to different cancer therapies, um, like uh, chemotherapy and, and different radiations. Um, and then also research from my, um, my team at King's, we've looked at um, the different bacteria's chemicals that they produce and show that that could help predict whether someone would respond um, to a different diet therapy if they had irritable bowel syndrome. Again, another uh, condition which we will chat about. Now, the final one I want to talk about in terms of our microbe CV is that they are a verified influencer. So for those who are into social media, you'll certainly know what that blue tick means. Uh, and essentially, it just highlights our microbes are great at communicating with all of the different micro, um, organs in our body. And in fact, overall, our microbes to date have been associated um, with at least 70 different chronic conditions. Um, we don't exactly know whether they're causing them, but we certainly know there is an association there. So they are linked with different diseases. Okay, so we've learned about what happens along that nine meters very briefly, what the microbes are actually doing. Now it's, it's time to look at actually how we look after our gut. So how do we nurture it through the right nutrition? Now, I think if we think historically about uh, nutrition and uh, disease, we've known um, for a long time our human-centric approach, very focused. We knew that food uh, did impact our disease, and we thought that was just due to human metabolism. But actually now recently, um, over the last couple of years, we've appreciated that actually a lot of the benefit of different diets is actually because of the microbes metabolism, not necessarily human metabolism. So another quiz for you guys, we'll bring up the poll again. What do you think our gut microbes a favorite nutrient is? Who thinks it's protein? Who thinks it's B, carbohydrates? Uh, who thinks it's C, it's fiber? Or who thinks it's D, fat? So have a think about that. I know it's a tricky one, but have a think uh, and let me know on your poll. Um, it is anonymous, so if you get it wrong, don't worry, no one's going to know. Five more seconds to make your decision. Okay, great. So a lot of you picked fiber, which is correct. Brilliant. So fiber certainly is our micro favorite food and fiber comes from all our different plant based foods. Now, the thing about fiber is that human cells can't digest it. So when we eat fiber, we are uh, our you know, through that small intestine, it gets malabsorbed and it ends up in that lower part where our microbes are. And that's where the microbes turn that fiber into beneficial chemicals. And we call these short chain fatty acids. So things like acetate, butyrate and propionate. Now, you don't need to know those names, but essentially they're like the chemical messenger molecules, which we think our microbes use to actually communicate with our other organs like our brain, our liver and our pancreas. So we think fiber is very important to that communication. And there's been an amazing study 
um, which included millions of people um, from an observational perspective. And what they found for every eight grams increase in fiber per day on a population level, we could reduce the risk of heart disease by 19%, uh, the risk of type 2 diabetes by 15%, and the risk of colon cancer by 8%. Now, I know some of you uh, might be thinking, gosh, that sounds incredible, certainly better than any drug out there, but actually what does eight grams of fiber mean? So it's a large potato with the skin on, so a lot of the fiber of potatoes in the skin. Um, and if you have a, a cold potato after you've cooked it and they cool it, actually that's got even more fiber because of the resistant starch. If you don't understand what that is, I have talked about that on my uh, Instagram account, so you can have a look at the post there. Um, some hummus and veggie sticks equals eight grams of fiber as well, or a can of beans, again, another eight grams of fiber. So really doable. Um, we just need to make that, those new habits. Now, I think uh, a point that a lot of people haven't quite appreciated is actually fiber isn't just one nutrient. There are so many different types of fibers and we think there's even, you know, six different categories that come from our plant-based food groups. So you've got your whole grains, your beans and pulses, your veg, your fruits, your seeds, and of course, your nuts. Each of them have got slightly different fibers within them. Um, and, you know, I think this highlights why it's important not to cut out any food groups. So I do see that there is a bit of a trend, particularly if people have some gut issues. They think if they cut out grains and they'll have better gut health. But actually, we see in the research that having cutting out grains can have dangerous knock-on effects. So this review paper, again, included close to 2 million. What they found is that for every 10 grams increase in fiber a day, people reduce their risk of colon cancer by 10%, which is great. They then looked at the effect of if they uh, people increase their um, intake of 10 grams of fiber um, from whole grains. And again, they found there was that nice reduction. However, they looked if they... Um, at the association between the fiber that came from just fruit and vegetables and sadly didn't see there was that protective effect against colon cancer. Now this is certainly not to say that whole grains are precious, more precious than any other category, but what it does highlight is that if we are cutting out food groups, we need to think about the negative effect that could have on our gut microbes. And it's not just colon cancer, there was another uh, paper which looked at breast cancer and found a very similar thing, that different fibres do different things. And what we're starting to see is that plant-based diet diversity is key. So it's not just about getting in your uh, 30 grams of fiber a day, but actually trying to get in as many different types of plant-based foods. So again, in the book, I talk a lot about getting in that diversity and little tips like adding um, you know, a seed shaker to your kitchen table. So whatever you're having, just add a sprinkle of mixed seeds on and you get four points straight up there. So there are many simple ways you can get more, more um, diversity in your diet and this uh, graph here you don't need to understand what it's shown is that people have at least 30 different types of plants in their diet per week actually had much better gut health than those who had lower diversity now i don't want to get you know too deep uh, in the science but this is a brilliant study um, that i think every single person should know about so this was undertaken by some colleagues in australia the food and mood center what they did is they took people who had moderate to severe depression so they had diagnosed depression and they randomized them to either this gut boosting diet or they had um, a befriending type of counseling and it was really important that there was a kind of placebo group which is the befriending type of counseling just to make sure any benefit in the diet group wasn't because they were um, seeing a dietitian because we do know that talking therapy can help so what they did is they had the placebo so the befriending type of counseling or the diet group uh, and they followed that for 12 weeks. And when they came back, they reassessed their mental health. And what they found is that those in the diet group, 32% of them had a significant improvement in their depression scores, which would have classified them as no longer clinically depressed. In the placebo group, that was only 8%. Now, I just think that is such a powerful study that shows that, you know, 12 weeks of a diet intervention had a significant improvement in people's mental health. For anyone who's listening to this and actually is on medications or if you're seeing clients, I certainly um, am not advocating people stop medications because all these patients stayed on their medications. But what it does highlight is that as an additional therapy, diet can have a huge role. And actually, perhaps before people get onto medication, maybe diet could prevent them from needing medication. And then in my clinic, I certainly have seen and I talk about uh, in Eat and Gluck some of the um 
some case studies where I share about one of my patients who was on medications and over time with the support of his GP as well, we were able to lower his dose um, and eventually he did end up coming off his antidepressants by focusing on his gut health. Now, of course, depression is super complex, so it's not for everyone, but I think it is important to realize there is growing evidence for that. So what did this diet actually look like? I'm sure many people want to know. Um, it actually contained 50 grams of fiber per day. Um, so remember, actually, no, I didn't mention that, but in, the, uh, in most countries, most um, Western worlds, um, we have about just under 20 grams of fiber a day. And generally, we, the government reckons we have 30 grams of fiber a day. This study actually gave 50 grams of fiber a day. And remember, fiber essentially feeds those good microbes. Now, I don't want to be biased and say it was all about the fiber. There's many other nutrients within this diet that they gave, which is very much a Mediterranean diet, which also supported uh, mental health. And again, I talk more about those different food groups um, in Eat and Gluck. Fermented foods, I just wanted to make a quick note on this because um, I know we, we are running out of time, so I don't want to go through it too in too much detail. Uh, but essentially, um, I am a huge believer in fermented foods. However, there isn't a lot of hard clinical evidence. Uh, me and my team, um, led by um, Dr. Demidi and Dr. Cox, um, have done a really nice review of the, of the clinical um, and scientific evidence for fermented foods, if you are interested in that. If you're more into just finding out about it, again, I have some recipes like um, for these fermented foods. So we've got the kefir grains. You can see my hands holding that. So I've got the recipes up for kefir, both water uh, and um, dairy kefir. Probiotics. So this is a huge one um, in that I think a lot of people now are hearing more about gut health, are hearing how, you know, potential how you know incredibly powerful it is um as for thinking okay i need to have a probiotic and then there was been you know some media highlighting um kind of trashing probiotics and saying that they're all quite useless so there is a lot of confusion in this space now i think that the media's um kind of headlines of saying that they're all useless is quite unfair but also, I certainly don't think everyone should be on a probiotic. I think there are some really um, powerful studies to suggest that for some indications, there's actually really good evidence. And in the book, again, um, I do give those seven different clinical indications where there is good enough evidence to recommend a probiotic. And when we think about the probiotics, we need to be asking ourselves um, these five questions. And again, in the book, I do talk about the different um, prescriptions in terms of the name of the bacteria, the dose they sh you should take it for, the duration, and what symptoms uh, may help improve. So I think it's important to think about probiotics kind of like a prescription rather than just taking any random one if you want to get the most out of them. Common complaint. So um, this was a really important chapter to include in Gluck because about 30% of us are struggling with gut symptoms at some stage. So it is super common, but very few people want to talk about it. Um, so I kind of wrote this in a way that I hope can be used as a first line kind of approach. If people are having issues with, you know, bloating or constipation or diarrhea, they can kind of assess, um, you know, what are some diet and lifestyle strategies they can try at home. And then if they need to, are the next steps to go to the doctor. It is though really, really important because often um, gut symptoms can mask under other underlying diseases that if you do have any of these red flags, that you do go to your GP straight away um, before trialing personal strategies. Uh, now, I just wanted to quickly touch on constipation because it's, again, hugely common, um, but very few people actually talk about it. And actually, it is um, not only common, but very, very expensive uh, for uh, these stats here came, came from the UK. Um, I couldn't get the Netherlands uh, stats on this. Um, I'm not sure if they've been published somewhere. Um, but each year, uh, it looks like constipation alone costs the government over uh, 150 million um, pounds, which is ridiculous. And actually around 200 people are admitted to hospital per day with constipation. So, you know, it is really, really common. So in Eat Yourself Healthy or Eat and Gluck, I do have a personalized strategies because, you know, historically people were just told to eat more fiber if they had constipation. But actually I see in clinical practice that adding more fiber 
can exacerbate constipation in some people. So I've written this personalized flow, a flow diagram that I hope people can then go, work through to understand and arrive at the best strategy that will help them out. Food intolerances, um, you know, I've just seen so many horrible cases. And again, in um, Eat and Glock, I do talk about some case studies, which hits home how dangerous a lot of these unfounded and invalid food intolerance tests are. So uh, a particular one is the IgG test, which um, essentially plays on a food allergy test. And it sounds legit, it looks legit. However, the international uh, you know, body of, of, of the immune system have come out with guidelines saying that these tests are completely invalid uh, and we should not be using them. And I've certainly seen people in clinic who've used these tests have come to me you know, on like 10 safe foods because they've been told they're intolerant to everything and they've got such a vicious and negative relationship with food because of these negative tests. So really advocating against them because there is zero evidence for them. Where we see the evidence for um, testing food intolerance, the only test, the only um, single test that's valid is for lactose intolerance. So that's milk sugar intolerance. And there is a breath test uh, that validates that. Um, for every other sort of intolerance, gluten intolerance, wheat intolerance, uh, there is a process which I call my 3R process. And this is actually uh, something that all dietitians uh, follow in terms of assessing whether someone has a legitimate food intolerance. So in Eat and Look, I have um, um, summarize the three different steps. Now, food tolerances can be really complex, but there are some really simple ones that you can kind of rule out or diagnose at home. So I do talk through when I, uh, that in the book and I give little tables of, you know, the food sources of these different nutrients. Um, or suspected uh, um, chemicals that we could be intolerant to. Uh, so it's about recording, then you're restricted, and then you reintroduce it. And I've included things like a gut diary that you record things and all those sorts of things. So again, I hope Eat and Look is written in a way um, that is very much like an action plan uh, that you can take away and you can you know, safely do um, work through things at home on your own. Because I do appreciate that you know private dietitians are not accessible for everyone. Now. Some people say to me, look, I've cut out, you know, things like gluten and I'm not sure if I'm intolerant to it, but, you know, I'm just going to cut it out because it's just easier um, than, you know, doing the whole three, three step reintroduction. And, you know, when it comes to people's diet, absolutely, it is always up to them to make the decisions. I'm never, you know, someone to tell people what to do, but I want people to be empowered with the evidence. And the evidence shows if you are cutting out some foods, um, then you could be doing, uh, you know, unexpected damage to your gut microbes. And you've seen studies uh, that I've referenced down here where they've actually shown people who go on a gluten-free diet actually have a negative impact on their gut microbes. And actually, if we think about a lot of the processed gluten-free foods out there, research has shown they contain less fiber, more fat, and more added sugars. So again, uh, it's not to say that um, you know gluten-free eating is unhealthy. It certainly can be healthy if you're having you know a lot of um, foods that you know, are just naturally gluten-free rather than processed foods, but you just need to be careful of that, uh, that not all gluten-free foods are necessarily healthy. IBS, uh, so I did say I would touch on this. So historically, we thought that IBS was just people who had a bit of a grumpy gut, but we now have strict diagnostic criteria uh, which assesses whether someone has a diagnosis of IBS. And again, I talk through that uh, in the book, but very briefly, there are seven to seven, four different types of IBS. And essentially, you diagnose that based on what your poops look like. Now, we understand that there are many different things that can cause IBS. So whether it's a gut infection, whether you've had uh, high dose antibiotics, whether you've had um, stress or trauma, but the underlying mechanism of IBS seems to be this dysfunction between the gut and the brain. Um, and a really nice study which kind of highlights that it's not just about diet, although in Eat and Glock I do have a modified low FODMAP diet, which is a, a bit more of a safer diet that people can follow at home because we know that this low FODMAP diet, many of you may have heard that before, that word before, it's actually a very complex diet and you do need hands-on support from a qualified dietitian to do that diet because again, it actually is damaging for your gut bacteria if you continue doing it any longer than six weeks. But in the book, I do have what I call my FODMAP light approach 
approach, which isn't as restrictive. But in this paper here, what they did is they took people with IBS and they randomized them to either this low FODMAP diet, which in clinical practice we consider gold standard because there's been many clinical trials showing it can have an acute benefit on IBS symptoms, or they randomized them to this gut-directed yoga flow. Um, and then after the 12-week intervention, they assessed all their symptoms. And what they found was actually, even though the yoga, uh, gut-directed yoga flow didn't change what they were eating, people had the same level of response as to the low, the gold standard low FODMAP diet. So it's not all about diet. Um, I think it's very much a combination. So again, in Eat and Gluck, I do have um, this modified gut directed yoga flow, which I worked uh, with a brilliant um, a yoga specialist. So what I did, I gave him the protocol that they used in this clinical trial. I said, look, we don't, I can't give people a 12 week program. I need to narrow it down to a 10 minute flow that people can start their day with. So he came up with this flow, uh, which I think is brilliant. I've got really good feedback from. Now in terms of uh, gut health, Yes, we know diet is obviously hugely important because we're essentially feeding our gut microbes um, what we're eating and therefore determining which ones grow and which ones don't. But also things like sleep, stress and exercise all have a big impact. So we know that there is this bi-directional relationship between our gut microbes and sleep. Um, so that's really important as well as moving our body. That can have an independent impact on our gut microbes and stress uh, also is hugely important. Now, the last chapter, which is probably my favorite chapter, is all about in the kitchen. And so there is 50 different uh, gut boosting recipes in the book, which really do highlight this philosophy of these seven different principles there. Um, and then I've also had a go at what I would consider my healthy eating plate, uh, because I'm always asked, what does gut health food look like? What are the ratios? So I've left it very broad in terms of people can fill in whatever types of veg and grains they like. but we kind of think overall that's what a gut healthy diet might look like. Um, and there is these seven different principles. One of the main things that we're seeing about gut health is that it's not about restriction. Um, it's about inclusion. So you can still include a lot of your favorite foods. And an example of this um, is with my prebiotic chocolate bar. So this recipe here, um, which has been quite a hit on social media, came about when I was doing my PhD in gut health and it was Easter and I thought, you know what, my favorite food is white chocolate. So I want to eat white chocolate, but white chocolate just feeds my taste buds. It does not feed my gut bacteria at all. So I absorb all that white chocolate in my small intestine. Bacteria get zilch. I thought, you know what, these microbes do so much for me. I'm a bit selfish by keeping all of that goodness to myself. Um, so I need to add something into this white chocolate that my microbes will like. So I choose prebiotic foods. So prebiotics come from your dried mango and your pistachio nuts. And then also added in some extra virgin olive oil into the white chocolate because there's chemicals in extra virgin olive oil that feed our gut bacteria. And then also drizzled it with some dark chocolate, again, which contains these things called polyphenols, which feed our gut bacteria. So what I did is turned a food that was very selfish um, and just fed my taste buds into a food that both my taste buds and my gut bacteria both got to enjoy. And that is the sort of principle that really does underlie um, Eat and Gluck's recipes and that it's not about depriving yourself of tasty foods, it's about working with both your taste preferences and your microbes taste preferences together. So on that note, I will thank you all for tuning in. Um, and I will take any questions you guys have uh, in the final five or so 10 minutes what we've got left so i made us bigger again thank you so much for all the information oh you talk fast so <laughs> really <laughs> so. ah. well maybe we do the replay and then do it a little bit slower <laughs> <laughs> your voice gets lower now no, it's great megan it's great um in the chat there's already a question um what's your opinion on a vegan diet it doesn't restrict fiber, but it yeah, is yeah, yeah. So um, vegan diets. What um, some scientists have done is looked at people who had a vegan diet versus those who had an omnivore diet. So they had plants, but also had um, meat and you know fermented dairy and things like that. And what they found is actually. 
whether they had a vegan diet or an omnivore diet didn't actually determine how good their gut health was. What determined how good their gut health was was actually um, the number of different types of plant-based foods in their diet. So actually, just because you're following a vegan diet, so 100% plant-based, doesn't mean you've got better gut health. Um, so you can have a really brilliant gut boosting vegan diet or a really crappy uh, vegan diet. Now, in again, in the book, um, I do, this is obviously the English version, uh, but I do have, let me just check what page, you can all refer to it. Um, I do have a page on the nutrients to watch out for. So if you are 100% plant-based, um, there are some nutrients. Uh, so things like your omega-3, your calcium, iodine, etc. So it is on page 69. Um, and I talk about the nutrients you need to be careful of um, if you are plant-based because you are slightly higher risk of different deficiencies. So I talk about some plant-based sources you need to make extra effort uh, to catch up on. Intermittent fasting, another really good question. So again, um, in the book, I do talk about it, the different types of fasting. Um, and overall, it's very much a personalized approach. So on page 63, I know this book back to front. Um, <laughs> it's very much a personalized approach, really. Um, there isn't any good quality human studies uh, which have shown that fasting has a benefit on our gut health. Um, if you are suffering with constipation, we do see that actually um, not snacking as much can help a little bit because we've got this movement called the mass movement, uh, which pushes, kind of put, helps you poop. Uh, and um, when we're in the fasted state after about an hour and a half, that muscle helps starts to kick in. So uh, if you are suffering with constipation, then trying not to snack all the time may actually help. Um, and then fasting, again, in the book, I do give suggestions about how to, if people want to try it, how to safely start to reduce down that eating window. Um, because we know if people want long, long fast in animal studies, that actually can have a negative impact on the gut bacteria because their um, bacteria get hungry. Because if you're fasting, they're fasting. Uh, and the animal studies, the bacteria actually start to eat away at the gut lining, the mucus lining. Um, which can obviously create things like inflammation. So I think being careful of long fast for sure. Okay. Wow, so sorry. Um, so yeah, there's questions, questions coming in. Uh, but first, um, just to make sure we're going to the questions, but the offer, because your book is out now and we are delighted to give all the people watching a little bit of discount. So I'm going to put it online just to make sure everyone sees it. If they want to buy the book, Follow the link you're seeing now, hopefully, then you get five euros off and you have it maybe tomorrow, otherwise the day after tomorrow at home. The Dutch version, of course, eat geluk. Um, eat geluk. So, yeah, just be, to make sure everyone sees it, because I can understand that not everyone is keeping up with all the questions. So just to be sure, at least you got yeah. your offer. So let's get back to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, there's so many. Um, the, the time of your meals impact um, on your digestion. Yeah, another really good one. So um, if people are suffering from reflux, so that's when food can kind of come up that food pipe the wrong direction, we do, we do see that actually having their final meal at least four hours before they go to bed can help reduce that. Um, I think in general, uh, not having, not eating a really large meal before you go to bed because it kind of just sits in your tummy for, for quite a, lo a long time um, is probably not great because when you sleep, your gut kind of does a lot of sleeping as well. However, if you've had a really long day and you've come home, I prefer you do have a meal versus you skip it and just go straight to bed. Um, so, you know, sometimes the clinic runs really late and I'm having my last meal, you know, at like 10 p.m. and I'm, then I'm in bed by 10.30. It's not ideal, but certainly I think nourishing your body takes precedent over worrying about what time you're eating. Um, but the most evidence comes from if you do have reflux. Um, is it worth doing a poop test uh, as you can see what foods to avoid? Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, um, a lot of the poop tests on the, that are clinically or commercially available actually don't tell us a lot of information that I couldn't already get from your diet history and your lifestyle um, kind of records. Uh, so in 
the research studies, so in our research studies, we always collect poop samples because we are trying to find out more about it. But the commercial tests they do are different from the ones we do in research. Uh, so at the moment, I think I would recommend people save their money, not do the poop tests yet. Um, unless you've got heaps of money, then do the test, find out what bacteria you have in you. But that's kind of where it stops. It's not going to tell you anything new or personalized yet. I think in give us like a year or two, uh, those more you know personalized questions about poop and and how that's you know informing what we should be eating i think that will come into to the commercial world it's just we're not quite there yet i just put in the link for the the book the offer oh brilliant yeah, people are asking for the code yeah so it's all Thanks. there uh, people asking about <laughs> um, Bio and Me. So I have a granola brand, um, so a, a food brand called Bio and Me, and people want to know um, I'm going to make it with that nuts in it. Um, and essentially the, the concept of Bio and Me is that we've included um, all different ingredients from your six plant-based food groups. So remember when I was talking about what's thought to be best is diversity. And there is a six different plant-based food groups. You've got your whole grains, your nuts, your seeds, your fruit, your veg, and your beans and your pulses. So in each bowl of the granola, we have each of those six different food groups. Um, so we do include the nuts for that reason. Hopefully we can come up with a variety that doesn't require that. Um, uh, So people are asking about um, our gut in obesity. And actually, yeah, there is really interesting studies where they've looked at people who are um, of a heavier body weight and those who are of the, you know, the healthy body weight and show that those who have a heavier bo body weight actually have different kinds of microbes in them. And they've gone a step further and are looking at fecal transplants, so poop transplants essentially, where they transplant the poop from a thin person and put it into someone who's overweight. And although the um, animal studies show that was like very positive and it showed that was a great weight loss tool, in humans, it didn't quite translate that way. They are looking at type 2 diabetes, though, and there has been some effects of poop transplants in um, helping with, like, insulin resistance uh, for people with type 2 diabetes. So there does seem to be, you know, somewhat of a benefit, um, but I don't think we've kind of got to the bottom, pun the pun, um, of poop transplants. I think they could be really powerful, but we don't quite know that yet. Um, people are asking about sugar. Uh, so that is a really good one because I think one of the things we, we see is that people are very much demonizing sugar and saying that if you have sugar, uh, that will feed candida overgrowth. Now, absolutely, I agree. Having loads of added sugar is not great, but I think people need to appreciate that if we are having added sugar, it actually is absorbed very high up that nine meter digestive tract. So actually it doesn't feed the bacteria. The why, why heaps of added sugar is not good is more of an indirect effect. And that is because our, um, if we're filling up on added sugar, we're actually not getting nutrient dense food those other plant chemicals so it's more of an indirect effect of why having loads of sugar is not great so I recommend getting your sugars from fruit which also have the fibers and the plant chemicals which feed the gut bacteria Um, people asking about brands of probiotics. So uh, it's very much remember about the strain of bacteria. So I never say um, that one brand of probiotic is, is for everyone or is better because each different strain does different things. So again, in the book, you'll see um, that there is a seven different indications and I've written down the names of the bacteria. So for example, if you have to go on antibiotics, for whatever reason, there's really good evidence to take a probiotic called Saccharomyces boulardii. And you would take that at five billion units twice a day throughout your antibiotic period and for a week after. So see how prescriptive that is? Um, that's actually how we have to treat probiotics to get use out of them. Otherwise, um, they're really not having that benefit, unfortunately, and you're kind of wasting your money, uh, which I don't want anyone to be doing. Great. Do we have time for one more? Let's do one more, yes. Yeah.
You're just crawling. Yeah, so, I, mean, I guess I see no, you just going no, through all the shit. Yeah. I'm trying to see if there's any common themes. Um, but uh, a good question around um, combining foods with digestion. So I think there has again been some myths out there that saying that if you should you should never eat um, fruit with a meal, or you should have. Um, you know, you should never eat your steak with your veggies and things like that, um, that you have to eat foods in a certain pattern. And that's certainly not the case. Um, we don't see that there is any need to do food combining unless you are vegan. And there is a little bit of evidence um, for combining things like grains um, and legumes together because they contain slightly different building blocks of protein, uh, which are kind of complement each other um, and again I talk about that more in the book um, but in terms of you know I guess overall recommendations like me personally I am not 100% vegan um, I eat mostly plant-based foods but I certainly do still eat uh, a lot of animal things like fermented dairy I eat quite a lot of fatty fish I eat quite a lot of um, and I see that you know what we should be advocating for people who eat loads of meat isn't necessarily they have to go vegan because that would just send people running uh, it's about making small little changes and I've done this to my husband um, where you know he used to have you know, 300 grams of steak like that was easy for him um, but what I've done is helped add in more fiber based foods um, and slowly decrease that amount of meat and actually what we see is that if you have protein from animals and fiber together that kind of has a less of a negative impact rather compared to if you just ate that protein because what it does is the fiber then feeds the gut bacteria instead of some of that protein so in that uh, that kind of um situation that it is kind of good to combine the animal products with fiber rather than just having a very meat heavy diet diet with no um, fiber added to it okay great i think we're at the end of our time don't you think yeah i think i think people <laughs> their heads may be starting to ache a little bit um, okay. but thank you all so much for tuning in i very much appreciate it uh, well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Um, yeah, as you know, I've got the Dutch version here already. I have the English one as well. I see some people in the chat already have the English one. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if there's much uh, difference uh, in them. Uh, I couldn't find really different things. So only the uh, the assessments uh, you have on your English website, they're in yeah. Dutch as well. So for people who like Dutch better, um, yeah, then please buy the book because all the assessments are in Dutch as well. So I think it's really, uh, really handy. Uh, so Megan, thank you very much for your, um, for your advice and all your knowledge. If there uh, are people on the replay and have more questions for you, I will pass them on, of course. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I hopefully uh, this is going to sell uh, 80, thousands more <laughs> in Holland and so you can help so many people here and uh, thank you very much for your time yeah no thank you